just a few nights ago, uh, Rachel and I, Rachel's been preparing this week for her trip to Chicago uh, starting tomorrow. Please pray for Andrew. He's having his first flight. Please pray for, please pray for the whole plane. Andrew's having his first flight. But part of that, uh, one of the tasks in getting ready was finding a couple more books to put on the e-reader so Rachel has something to read for uh, the week that she's there before I can load up more stuff. And I happen to find this one Christian trilogy that I got ready and got put on there that as I'm reading the equivalent of the back cover, it's got suspense, it's got adrenaline, it's got intrigue, it's maybe even got a little bit of danger in there, some plot twists, everything a good story needs, uh, or a proper fiction story, at least in my opinion. I know others may have different tastes, but as we've studied the Lord's Prayer over the last couple of weeks, maybe you've seen some of the same. Some danger, some intrigue, some, you're really going to pray that? Well, today is no different. And today's stanza that we're going to go over doesn't exist in a vacuum. doesn't exist all by itself as one little thing. But it's a stanza that has a calling to it, a stanza that, call, that has a response for us to be able to live out, and it's a dangerous one, what Augustine called a terrible one. <laughs> Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you again for this prayer your Son taught us. Though we may have said it a million times by rote memory, allow us to really let the wor- weight of the words sink in and make this prayer come not from our memorized head, but from deep in our hearts. Amen. Well, scripture, as we've seen the last couple of weeks, comes out of Matthew 6. It says, Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I say it's a bit of a dangerous one in that you hear that part that comes after what we normally consider the Lord's Prayer. If you forgive others, your Father will forgive you. It also brings up kind of one of those uh, intriguing questions like I was talking about before. That we pray for forgiveness. Well, as Christians, aren't we already forgiven? And yet we're praying for forgiveness. Well, I'm going to answer that or address that kind of in two parts here. Yes, we are already forgiven in a judicial sense of the word, in the sense of being forgiven once for all for our sins and having a relationship with God, having salvation. In that one-time forgiveness, God took the death penalty, the death debt, as we say when we, in our tradition, we use the word debts, that death debt off of our shoulders, put it onto Christ, and once and for all, Christ dealt with that. For those who accept Christ's death for their forgiveness, that happens at one point and is, covers our lives. When God can look at the Christian and see not our sinfulness, but Christ's death and righteousness. So why pray, forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses, whatever wording you may use. Although it not be God's plan, Christians still sin after salvation. Amen? It doesn't take but maybe a day after becoming a Christian to understand that. And while sin doesn't ever sever our relationship with God, that has been established once and for all by Christ's sacrifice, it does strength. As an example, um, I have a mother. have had one for all my life, thank God. If I lie to my mom, does that mean she's not my mom anymore? Or I'm not her son anymore? 
No, we still have that relationship. But the closeness of our relationship, the intimacy of our relationship, if I can use that word loosely, <clears throat> isn't quite the same. And it's not until I were to confess my sin, ask for forgiveness, when she may uh, hopefully forgive me, that that relationship kind of gets restored and that strain gets eased or put back together. And it's similar with God. Again, because of that sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, when we sin, we're still children of God, the same way I'm a child of my mother. But when we sin, that relationship gets strained, gets the closeness isn't quite there. Not that God has moved anywhere, but that we have sort of stepped away. It becomes harder in those moments to experience that joy and that abundant life that Christ died for so that we could experience. But when we pray, forgive us our sins, which would probably be the best understanding or translation of that whole idea. It's like coming before the table with God and saying, you know, being at this bountiful feast that perhaps the prodigal son and his father may have had. And when we sit down there at the table with God and we say, all right, you know what, there's some stuff getting in the way of our relationship. Walls of sin building up between us as our prayer of confession has. Confessing, asking God to forgive, says, you know what, let's get that stuff out on the table and deal with it. And by God's grace, he faithfully deals with them. And that intimacy is restored, that relationship becomes restored again and healed again. But then comes the part that has that little bit of danger in it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive others to translate it a bit simpler. This was one that I had to struggle with a little bit as I thought about, is God's love, is God's forgiveness conditional? <clears throat> well, first off, allow me to clear the air in saying God's grace, God's forgiveness is not based on anything we do. No matter how many times we may forgive, it doesn't earn us or merit us God's forgiveness or God's grace. Even the ability to forgive in the first place is a gift of God. Left to our own devices, uh, when somebody sins against us, what's the first reaction going to be? I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to sin against them, whatever it looks like. Certainly our first reaction, apart from God, isn't, I think I'll forgive. I think I'll clear the debt. It's a, what Paul might call in Philippians 2, a working of God in our lives, a way that God works in our lives to even give us the gift of, try, of being able to forgive. But here's the rub about it. How forgiven we are, or how forgiving we are, F-O-R-G-I-V-I-N-G, how forgiving we are is a barometer for how forgiven we are, F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N. It's the reason that Augustine calls, as I've titled the sermon, a terrible petition, one that's just scary to make, because it's a true acid test of our Christianity. If you, let's play this out a little bit, the end result, so to speak, of our Christianity, we may often think it's salvation, which is certainly a big part of it, but the end result is for us to be more Christ-like, to attain Christ-likeness, not that we ever become as good or as holy as Christ, but to get further and further along, to be more and more like Christ, to have a life that emulates His. Well, here's an example of Christ and forgiveness, this man that we are to try and emulate His life as best we can. Does anybody know the context of this phrase, this verse, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing? Where was that said? On a, cross. On a cross. Jesus is saying this about people who are killing him. How's that for an act of forgiveness? A bar of forgiveness to try and attain. How does he talk about his killers? His murderers, essentially, because he's being killed unjustly at best. Father, forgive them. How many of us could offer a prayer like that in a situation like that. 
But if we are to become more and more like Christ as we mature in our Christian walk, though we may certainly not be at that point, Christ's actions become more a part of us and we become more willing to forgive as we mature. So what would you think of a person who, when they are sinned against, when somebody hurts them, they say, you know what, forget forgiveness. I don't even want to think about it. I refuse to forgive. How forgiving we are is a barometer of how forgiven we are. And I'm not talking about it's really, really, really hard for me to forgive right now, or I'm not quite ready, or I'm so still in shock from the hurt that I'm not at the place where I can forgive. I'm not talking about that yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. But somebody who flat out says, no, I know God tells me to forgive, but I refuse to do it. It's a sign, a barometer, if you will, that this core value or trait of Christianity has not yet sunk in. That by God's grace, they may be forgiven, but that has made no impact into their heart yet. It becomes something to pray for that wall to break down just a little bit more. It kind of plays out in a uh, parable that Jesus gives when he's talking about the kingdom of God. And there is a man who owes a ser servant, who owes his master, a lifetime's worth of debt. And the master decides he's going to call the debt. Calls the servant in and says, I know you owe me more than you could ever pay, but I'm collecting the debt. And the servant says, please, be patient with me. Give me a little more time and I will repay you. And the master graciously says, you know what? The debt is cleared. I will forgive it. I will let it go. You don't owe me anymore. And the servant is very thankful for it. And he goes out of the master's chambers. And he finds another servant below him who owes him a week's worth of wages. A couple bucks. And he grabs the man by the throat and he says, Pay me my money! Give me what you owe me! Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Woodland Community Church. And the servant falls on his knees and says, please give me a little more time and I'll pay you back, I promise. And the servant says, off to jail with you. He hasn't beaten until the man can repay. Well, the other servants find out about this and they start to get scared. And they go before the master and say, and tell him what's been going on with this servant. The master calls him back in and he says, you fool. You owed me a lifetime's worth of debt, and I cleared it. Shouldn't you have been able to pass it on to the servant who owed you a couple of bucks? From there, sends him off to jail to be tortured until he can pay back that lifetime's worth of debt. Which character represents best the one who says, I will not forgive? How did it turn out for him? So what do we do when everything about us says, you know what, skip forgiveness. I can't do it. I don't have it in me. Because there are certainly some instances in our lives that we experience in our fallen world that can do that to us. Deep hurt. Deep betrayal from those that are closest to us. Wounds that we may have held on to for decades. They may have affected us our entire lives. I'm sure you can fill in the gaps of what it looks like for you, for yourself. Maybe you can even think of some of those instances. Things that still hold on to you. I won't even say we hold on to. But all of them are things that can make for a discord in us experiencing the abundant life and the joy that Christ offers. In a life lived with forgiveness involved. Well, I'm certainly not going to try and five minutes to answer the world's hurts. I will not claim to have that kind of knowledge or insight, but I'll give you a couple of practical things that may help inch you along just a little bit towards being able to say, I can forgive, and I can experience that joyful life again. First off, that forgiveness does not require a lobotomy, in that 
Forgiving somebody does not necessarily mean we completely forget the memory of what happens. I know in my life there have been some people that have hurt me that I have since been able to forgive. It doesn't mean I forgot what happened. But the choice I made about how I'm going to look at it, looking at it through the lens of forgiveness rather than the lens of of grudge and hatred, allows me to forgive and remember at the same time. Trying to force forgetfulness will at best look like sweeping it under the carpet, which will certainly do no good. And at worst, knowing it's going to come right back up again, rearing its ugly head at the surface. Biblical forgiveness, and it's one of the ways that uh, our language of using debts in the Lord's Prayer really is about forgiving a debt, clearing a debt, not refusing to acknowledge that the debt ever existed, but to say, I'm not going to hold this debt over you. It's paid, it's done, it's cleared. The slate is clean, we can move on again. A second truth or aid. Forgiveness doesn't mean everything is hunky-dory again. In that relationships that are strained can take, a, 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 can take time and effort to repair. That forgiveness is not just within our relationships. It's not, okay, I forgive you, Everything is back fine again. Trust has to be re-earned, has to be worked towards again. For example, I could forgive a thief for their theft. Doesn't mean I'm going to lend them money again right away. Forgiveness, though, like discipline, is focused on restoration, on bringing back, closing the gap little by little of that trust that may have been shattered, that hurt that may have been shattered, that relationship that's been uh, strained. And as long as we have in mind that goal of trying to bring back together, things can work out. Things can move in the right direction. And the third aid that I'll offer, when all else fails, pray. Now I don't mean for this to sound like a, a trite, phrase to say, yes, pray, and God will give you, you know, the ability to forgive, although he will do that. But let me amp it up a little bit to say pray for this person that you're struggling to forgive for whatever reason. This keeps certainly any uh, vengeful hardness in check that you may have towards them, because I'll tell you this, Again, from experience, it's awfully hard to hate somebody and pray for them at the same time. Which one's going to win? Hating somebody or praying for them? Because it's awfully hard to do both. Prayer can certainly be good for us anyways. Like I said, God can soften our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit to be able to forgive or to get closer to forgiveness. Even if it means, God, forgive them because I'm still struggling with it right now. Ultimately, it reminds us of our primary motivation for forgiving, forgiving others. That we have a God who we pray to, who looks at our debts, says, debt cleared, paid in full, by a son who said, I love you this much, as he spread out his arms on a piece of wood and gave his life.